to this at, um, as we begin the meeting. And it uh, welcome to April, everyone. And again, welcome to just a, you know, just a holy cow, just a, kind of a very busy season for us all. Hey, the first slide we're looking at here is a slide that um, I'll, I'll repeat again as we get into the meeting presentation. But, um, uh, but the, you know, after two years, right, the conference is going to go live as well as virtual. So we'll have an opportunity, right, we'll have an opportunity to um, uh, actually come together in Olympia, right, for, uh, you know, for a three day conference at the end of September. So uh, mark these dates and it, uh, 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 bookmark the page mglearns.org uh, for the state conference, which will be happening. So here we are. Uh, we are here in April, and we're going to talk about the April to-dos, not the March to-dos. <laughs> so it, uh, so I'm I'm busted for a repeating the slide, and it uh, and not uh, and and not uh, editing all all aspects of it. Uh, we got a lot of information to cover today, uh, and uh, Jake Poole will be joining us here in about a half an hour. And it, uh, his, this is going to be a very unique presentation, I assure you, from Jake. So this is really going to be fun. As we jump into April here, we've got a bunch of um, uh, uh, birthdays. It's interesting, they're all in the same week, right? This week. So uh, Midge, if you're on with us now, happy birthday. You know, Anne, Karen, Brenda, and Gloria, happy birthday this week. Um, and it, uh, it, uh, we've also got, obviously, it, uh, we had session three of the training on April 2nd. Session four is coming up uh, this, uh, you know, this uh, uh, Saturday. Um, Ocean Shores has an opening workshop week after next, and session five of a training study group is is at, um, is is oh, I'm sorry, it's not yesterday, it's next Monday, right? So study group should be at um, was it yesterday or is it next Monday? Next Monday. It's next Monday, the 18th. Yeah. So my apologies here. Um, so in the URL in the in the e news right is the uh, the web ID the Zoom ID for um, uh, for next Monday's 1 p.m. Um, uh, study group. My apologies for placing it on the 11th here, but it's on the 18th. Okay. So reminder of who we are. We're gathering here today as a foundation. Uh, we have three purposes, you know, as per our bylaws, to educate and inform the public. Uh, we fundraise for growth and we engage together uh, to socialize, to network, and to learn. Uh, with that, then, we have our 2022 elected board. Uh, uh, PJ is, at, uh, is, uh, is in Oregon today with limited uh, Zoom uh, capabilities, so she may or may not be joining us here. Sabine is our president-elect. Uh, the rest of the, at, uh, of the board is here and, at, uh, and, at, uh, and, uh, and definitely welcoming your support as volunteers. Um, Tony is our uh, faculty liaison. Alina and Brenda, uh, Brenda are our coordinators. Um, again, a shout out to everyone. Uh, uh, reminder that as a service organization here, uh, it is our obligation to get involved and to volunteer. And there's no shortage of places where we can all be of assistance here. Um, so I, and especially I'm highlighting John, Margie, Terry, and Cindy's uh, committee responsibilities here because they've got a lot going on. And as you saw from e-news coming in, we're coming into, uh, obviously we're in the middle of training for our interns, our 2022 training cohort. Um, Terry's got a, gar a home and garden tour coming up in six weeks. We're going to be talking more about that. Um, uh, Margie is working with uh, Chris and at uh, Kohler on the, uh, on the website and additional work there. And at um, John, together with Cindy and the Demo Garden and Youth Outreach with Elizabeth, lots of stuff happening here. April Two Dudes. This is coming from Oregon State University. And a uh, shout out here for all those of you who are writing in your garden journal, right, and maintaining accurate records. Uh, <laughs> this is the time. This is that this is always kind of do as we say, not as we do, right? You know, but as, our, as we grow older and our memories fail, it might be nice to uh, it might be nice to keep uh, you know to keep uh, to keep a written journal of what uh, of what it all we're doing here. Uh, vegetable plantings when the soil is consistently above sixty degrees, some warm season vegetables can be planted. You know, and you will see that I just picked up the seven day average temperatures off of um, uh, WSU's um, uh, Ag WeatherNet. 
And it, uh, we're still a long ways away from 60 degrees <laughs> in just about every place. And in fact, I assure you, the most recent temperatures, we actually went down from these averages. So these, uh, it's been a chilly day, as some of us were talking before the meeting started here. Um, so we've still got a ways to go before soil temperatures are up and uh, are up and started. I imagine most a lot folks though do have starts going, uh, hopefully in covered greenhouses or in covered uh, in covered areas. Maintenance: a lot of spring flowering bulbs allow the foliage to brown and die down before removing the spring flowering bulbs. And indeed, this may explain some of the issues we had, uh, we were talking about earlier with, the, with moving trilliums around when they were still in full bloom. Um, obviously, string blooming uh, shrubs and trees, it's time to prune and shape after the blossoms fade. This was an interesting topic we talked about with the trainees at our April 2nd um, uh, uh, pruning workshop with the, train, with the 2022 trainees, when to prune. Um, a lot of fertilizing, composting, cut back ornamental grasses to just a few inches above the ground. Now, mind you, we're talking ornamental grasses here. Uh, the native grasses, um, uh, such as the calamagrasses that I'm a, a big fan of, you know, I just let grow uh, year round because uh, you can appreciate that the, uh, the, the long strands, the long blades of those grasses, as they lay down, they actually uh, um, help um, uh, spread, they help the spread of the rhizome by it, uh, blocking out other competing grasses. Lawns, optimum time to fertilize, you know, and again, it's just, this is of course the challenge of it, um, not fertilizing too much, you know, one pound nitrogen per oh. thousand square feet. It's interesting though, if you contrast this with what a golf course might use, right? You know, they're certainly using a lot more than one pound of nitrogen. Um, and it, uh, boy, that uh, 2300 fertilizer mix for a golf course is not, uh, is not um, untoward. Guard against late spring frost. And boy, that's uh, something we don't need any, we don't need any reminders about. Um, you know, this is again on it. Uh, 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 you can you can uh, find out where you're at relative to when your latest frost might be coming up, and it um, and everywhere everywhere we're looking here, right? You know, um, you could we could still have frost um, coming up in the next few weeks here. So it um, it's uh, we've got a lot. Um, you know, this we we have to. It, it's it's appropriate that we're cautious in terms of what we're putting out there. Um, given especially the weather of this past week and the snow that many of us are looking at even, even today. And then finally, under uh, pest management here, we're looking at, um, you know, we're looking at uh, uh, labeling and uh, making sure that any, uh, any uh, um, uh, chemicals uh, we're using, uh, we are following all label directions. Um, and it, um, uh, this is at... Uh, um, this is obviously an interesting time in terms of when we're thinking about using pesticides or herbicides at this point, um, given that we've got so much precipitation and there's such a chance of runoff and, at, um, and just uh, ineffective, um, ineffective use. So planning propagation, you know, a lot of starts and, at, um, uh, and, at, um, and a lot of, um, and a lot of uh, choices. Um, you know, at, uh, again, Oregon is, at, uh, is really recommending a lot of opportunities here to be pushing out a lot of, um, a lot of uh, vegetable starts. Um, but as we discussed, you know, boy, given precipitation and temperature and uh, soil conditions, um, you know, this might be a dicey time to be, uh, to be starting some of that. Anyway, any comments? Comments in terms of how they, uh, our spring gardens are coming along? Comments in terms of how the landscape's making things happen? Anyone with anything to share? No, I'm just curious about the, the um, camas at the Iwako Garden. Did it come up? It came, it came up, Robin, and it is incredibly beautiful. It is all in bloom and looks out. Wonderful. It um, looks I'm, outstanding. Bev, you want, yeah. you're on mute, but you want to share? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, pretty much every camas bulb we planted came up. And so we have it all over and it's just beautiful. It just, it just started to bloom probably a couple of weeks ago. And we were at the garden last week on Thursday and we were able to enjoy them immensely. So yeah, my, my thank you just, for donating them. <laughs> mine are just coming up like this last week. So I'm behind you, but um, yeah, next year you'll have twice as many. <laughs> but a big shout out just for, for everyone Good. to make a big shout out here is that Robin generously donated last year a ton of camas bulbs to the Owaco Demo Garden. We dutifully planted them 
And I tell you, Robin, it's going to be a treasure uh, for generations to come. So thank you so very much for that uh, for that donation. No, oh, no problem. I'm sure I'll have more this year if anybody wants them. <laughs> they are indeed beautiful. Any other comments? Any other comments in terms of how our vegetable gardens are coming up and how our uh, how our starts are coming? Other announcements, other announcements coming into. I want to share it. Uh, I'll have a, a couple slides here and I'll come back to others uh, for announcements. Um, uh, uh, I noticed that uh, we've got the, uh, uh, you know, the Foundation Bylaws Committee has been doing a lot of work, as you, as you read in the e news. Um, uh, we have a, a committee meeting this week uh, uh, coming up for the, uh, for the Bylaws Committee, the next meeting of our foundation on May 10th, that'll be the first reading of amended bylaws. And at, uh, in the next meeting after that in June, we'll have a second reading and we can vote as a foundation here to accept these amended bylaws. So a big shout out of thank you to the committee uh, that is working hard on updating and, at, uh, and revising these. Because there has been some changes to Washington state laws regarding nonprofits. And it um, and it uh, and you know and over the years, of course, you know a lot of the um, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of the articles of uh, of the bylaws become a little dated, and it uh, and benefit from a review. So, um, PJ or anybody else in the committee, any comments on the foundation bylaws revision underway? This is PJ. Can you hear me, Kelly? We can. You're coming yeah, in. Okay. Thank you. Woo. Um, uh, the committee and many, many thanks to Gary Fredericks for uh, walking us through and just keeping us on track. Uh, we almost brought them to you this meeting and we all decided we wanted to have one more good read with the revisions as they are right now before we send them all out to you. If anyone on this call needs a hard copy, please let one of us on the committee know and we'll send you a hard copy. Otherwise, I'm going to send it um, probably to John and Katie or someone to, to post it so that we get it to all the email membership. But uh, remember everyone, this is a draft revision. We worked hard to get everything sort of up to snuff because it, it's been about nine years since we really did hard work on it, it appears. And uh, what we did is not set in stone. It's just uh, ready for the membership to look at after this Friday. And the meeting will be on Zoom at one o'clock. If anyone wants to join and listen, just let me know. We'll get Gary to form, forward you a Zoom link. And uh, I'm, I'm really proud of all the work that everyone's done. Everyone just kept plugging away. Any questions or comments for PJ regarding the bylaws update? Again, thank you guys for the committee for the work. Looking forward to the revised bylaws. Right. Okay, Tapio Scholarship, we have till May 1st. Until May 1st, we can get the scholarship applications in. Um, anybody from the scholarship committee on today to comment on applications as they might be coming in? Well, just uh, I know that Trish and the committee have done a, a big job of reaching out. I mean, there's a lot of schools, right, to reach out to across our two counties. So it, uh, just uh, uh, getting the word out there and, it, um, and especially in this in these COVID times of um, how you get them, um, uh, how you get scholarships uh, played out here. Uh, we've, we've been very successful with these scholarships, of course, in the past and very much looking forward to, you know, whatever candidates will be able to, uh, you know, uh, will be submitting uh, for this go around. Okay. Well, I'm on the committee, but I have no idea how many applications we've received so far. Well, we still have a, a few days, to, a few weeks to go here before May 1st. So let's just, uh, you know, we ought to reach out to Trish and get an update. Training schedule, you know, as, it, uh, as we mentioned, we are well underway. So at, uh, I, at, uh, 
uh, I want to thank, by the way, everybody who helped uh, helped me in, in the session three on the woody landscape plants uh, on April 2nd. And a big shout out just for the composition of this training cohort. This is a solid cohort. These guys are energetic. Um, some um, great collaboration. Um, and I would encourage uh, if, if you if you if you look ahead at the calendar and at the at the leaders for each of these uh, sessions here, uh, if there's interest in, in helping or in participating, um, you know, please reach out to the session leaders. If you saw in the e-news, Mike Carvia is directly asking for some assistance uh, for his program on April 30th. I know that Sharon Golightly is asking for assistance for her plant clinic session on, uh, on May 7th. So I'd encourage everyone to be the, the looking ahead and engaging in these, um, you know, engaging in these trainings. Not only is it program hours as a volunteer, but if indeed you, um, if indeed your um, uh, the training leader is, is is prepared to accept you as a you know, for continuing education, you're very welcome to join in that world. Yeah. Any comment, um, Jude or Cindy, in terms of training? Uh, they're a great bunch, Kelly. As you know, after having done your woody plant session. Very enthusiastic. We need to give them encouragement though. Hopefully we're gonna keep a whole bunch of this crew because we, we need some new people to restore our losses from the past several years. Very good. So shout out to everybody and it, um, you know, it, uh, and again, look ahead in the calendar and be thinking about how we all can participate. Kelly, could you go back to that slide? I just noticed um, in, uh, session five, Mike Carvia, um, he has a new email address. Oh, dear. Yeah. You know what it is? mjcarvia at gmail.com. Why don't you put that in the chat there, Beth? I will. Yeah, I think that was also in the in the e-news. I think the, I'm sure the correct email was in the e-news. And by the way, it's just a quick reminder. If you if you did not receive the e-news, right, reach out to either John or to Katie, and it uh, you know let's figure out why, you know, and it uh, and it uh, and make sure that um, we've got uh, any correct emails um, are in the are in our email list. Okay. Can I give a reminder to everybody um, regarding registration for the annual education continuing ed session in Olympia. They have early registration, which would allow quite a savings starting May the 1st. So you need to look for that announcement. It'll save you money in registration. So um, be sure to register early. Got another slide coming up on that in a, in a minute here, Sharon. Good. Yep. Thank you. Regarding informing our members, by the way, you know, it's just that, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, for just, just as Sharon's doing here, let's make sure that we've got adequate time, right, in terms of getting the word out in terms of, you know, in terms of some of these deadlines that need to happen here. So let's do be thinking about, um, uh, you know, the e-news, you know, um, Katie and John need that feedback on the very on the first on the first Tuesday of the month. Um, website um, updates to uh, Margie or Chris need to happen in plenty of time for calendar updates. And of course, any email blast, which we try to limit so that we're not, uh, you know, we're not deluging our inboxes. Um, all those email blasts should be thought of um, uh, well in advance. And so thank you, Sharon, for making sure that we're always, we're thinking well in advance of when, it, uh, when we need to get word out there and when things need to happen. Okay. A discussion topic we want to have here, um, and this is um, this is something to be thinking about here, is that um, uh, Sharon G and Sharon KB, Chris and Sabine, have been involved with a committee, an ad hoc committee, over the past month, thinking about what to do as we think about emerging from COVID times. And it, uh, you know, there's a, uh, uh, you know, a recommendation. This is the idea: is that when do we start getting together again for face-to-face -face meetings? And so a recommendation is emerging from this, uh, from this committee that we actually consider satellite clusters of face-to-face -face meetings that would be Zoomed together so that we would have an opportunity to, yes, come together physically, but not have to force everyone to drive to a single location across our two county area. So um, 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 Sharon, uh, KB, Sharon G, um, 
you want to comment or amplify on what I've just shared? Well, first of all, I want to thank my ad hoc committee uh, with Sharon Coolish Bales, uh, Chris, and Sabine for working on this jointly. Uh, especially Sharon put together the spreadsheet. We have over 20 sites in all of our respective communities that as we as a committee think are adequate for meeting for um, a master gardener group. Um, they have kitchen facilities are handicapped accessible. The hours are compatible with our hours in um, they have uh, screens or whiteboards and some audio visual uh, equipment. Um, and we wanna make uh, some recommendations and the spreadsheet, I'm not sure who it goes to, um, but it is available to all of our membership for uh, cluster meetings, such as uh, what Sharon Coolish Bales is going to have for her presentation um, in uh, South Bend. Um, does anybody on my committee want to make a comment right now? Anyhow, I, I, we want to make a recommendation that um, we purchase as soon as possible because uh, we are going to do a couple presentations here shortly in May. Uh, about um, what they call an owl. And we estimate the expense of an owl, which facilitates um, in-person learning in these cluster groups. And this enables one central location to broadcast this out to other areas to um, help people not have to travel all the way to Elma. For instance, down here on the Long Beach Peninsula or in Ocean Shores or in Montesano. And so we would recommend and ask the board to consider purchase of a couple of owls for instructional purposes. And our organization would own these owls. Kelly, would you like to explain to everybody what an owl is so what? everybody can understand? I can come back to that, but Sharon KB, I think okay. you wanted to share something. Yeah, I, I, the class that I that I'm responsible for on May 21st is going to be in three different locations, held all at the same time. <clears throat> so having something like an owl or other conference capable equipment is going to be really critical for us. One of the three locations we're talking about already has that. That's at the Elma Extension Office. So. Uh, and I think we can get by with at least one, but we need to talk about that. And so this is a, you know, a board decision. But one of the things that, that we talked as an ad hoc committee is it takes a long time, it takes a lot of time to travel from you know, where Kelly lives to up to even Kazi for a, basically it ends up being a full day for him. And <laughs> I'm seeing Bev nod her head, yes. And Elena would be in that same boat. I come close because I joined that group. But it's, so what we're looking at is really saving people time. And yes, we still get to get together, but we won't be seeing everybody at the same time. Uh, the other thing we've talked about is the possibility of still having some full group meetings. And all this is still in the discussion stage. There's nothing that is in concrete at this point. But I'm kind of excited. So we wanted to bring it to everybody's to the foundation meeting here, um, uh, just for, to gather any thoughts or any at, um, any perspectives. You're welcome to share something in the chat or to share any comments if you have here. Again, this is just an idea. This is a concept. The board will be discussing this at the board meeting that follows the meeting here. Um, comments, questions, thoughts. Kelly, all I was going to add is I think part of the reason for this is folks who are unable to join by Zoom because of connection difficulties or technology or whatever, it would give them a chance to be back in meetings. Mm -hmm. It's a very good point, Chris, is that indeed there is a number of people just given the geography 
um, that um, you know, internet is still a challenge for a lot of folk here, as well as the social aspects of coming together. And I don't want to diminish that. I was surprised myself in our April 2nd uh, Woody Landscapes class with the 2022 class, some of the comments that uh, they, they, at the end of the day in the evaluation, they really valued coming together to work together on projects and to interact together. And so it was interesting to see coming together, socializing and networking as a true value of being, uh, of being in this training. So we don't want to diminish the idea of coming together for face-to-face -face meetings. I want to follow up on um, having some cluster meetings. For those people who are still working, taking the day off to come to a foundation meeting just isn't a possibility, but just taking the time of a meeting might make it possible for some of our working people. Excellent point, Karna. Other comments? You do know that COVID's not gone away yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. The BA2 variant is out, and then Washington State's one of the bad states that has it. Thank you for that reminder. <laughs> so, so um, Kelly, um, I have a question. Can you explain how the meetings and the Zoom would would be happening at the same time? Or I didn't, I missed. So the yes. Yeah, so, so the concept is that uh, when. When, uh, when Sharon's were talking about this owl, basically there are there's equipment out there that instead of just looking at the, the little camera and the little microphone coming out of your laptop or your desktop, um, this is equipment that actually has a 360 degree camera and a much, much improved stereo speaker system as well as microphone system. So this is a unit, think it's about the size of, these units are about the size of a small vase and they attach via USB port into a computer. So basically at each of these satellite locations, there would be a single laptop and a, um, you know, a, uh, one of these, uh, these microphone speaker devices. And so uh, you have a cluster of people, is it five, is it 10, is it 15, is it 20 that might be gathered in a particular location. And you are able to see on the screen that's being projected, you're able to see, um, uh, you know, you're able to, you're able to participate in a Zoom and everybody in the room is able to, uh, you're able to, uh, these, um, uh, the, the, these, these cameras actually pick up who is speaking and actually push the camera to that, uh, that individual. Um, you have full audio and visual. So does that help, Kath? Uh, it is. So uh, two questions. <clears throat> If you have, let's say, 20 or more people looking at one little laptop, wouldn't that kind of, for instance, there's a speaker giving a presentation during, you know, during the presentation time, uh, wouldn't, and they might be showing uh, slides, wouldn't this, wouldn't it be hard to see that? Or can people bring their laptops with them? Or can people also be participating by Zoom at home if they can't come to the meeting. It's a yes. yes. It's a yes and yes and yes and all those all those scenarios. And in fact, the uh, uh, in a large meeting like that, you would typically you would be projecting that screen. So there'd be a projector that would be also attached. Uh, um, uh, so it's not you, you're not it's not 20 people staring around a small laptop. It'd be 20 people looking at a at a at a, at a screen that would be projected or at a monitor. Let's say if you're at a library or the, the PUD where you have large monitors that uh, the, the laptop can attach to. Okay, and, and Kelly, these owls are portable. They can be carried from place to place. Oh, very much so. In fact, I would encourage us just, I, I, we don't have any uh, images on the, on the slides right here, but you can just Google what these things look like. Um, and it, um, uh, it's just, they're about the size of a small vase. And they, again, they plug into your USB port on it uh, on a computer. So it, uh, basically it's just a better microphone and speaker system that, um, that greatly improves uh, the accessibility to Zoom from a large group. We'll talk more about this. And again, there's nothing. Um, and as as um, as uh, you know, as, as John so poignantly mentioned here, we still got uh, we. It'll be a while here before we're able to even consider gathering together in super large groups. Um, um, and I imagine we're going to be we're, we're still going to be zooming here for some time. Hey, I want to move on to a couple things here and uh, make sure we have some uh, time to talk about calendars here. Uh, Home and Garden Show is coming up in just 
a few weeks here, just a few weeks, a little over a month. Uh, mark your calendars also for the July 23rd garden tour. Uh, in May next month, make sure your calendars are also marked relative to the plant sale on Mother's Day, uh, uh, as well as the plant sale on the 7th too, right? Right, Terry? Uh, the plant sale is only on the 7th, Saturday the 7th. Excuse me. So, okay. So this is indeed incorrect here. So the plant sale will be on the 7th, not on Mother's Day the 8th. Right, right. And it'll be in Ocean Shores at Garden by the Sea and at the Greenhouse um, on uh, Russmeyer Road. Wow. So two locations on Saturday the 7th, Saturday the 7th. Then again, set up on the 12th and the 13th, the Thursday and Friday, and the show Indian on the 14th and 15th. And I think you saw uh, um, in the in the in the e-news, um, you know, at uh, the volunteer sign-up form. Um, and at um, uh, Terry, any other comments on that particular on the uh, in terms of particular areas where you're looking for volunteers, or where we, where we really want to make sure that we've uh, we're we're buttressing our support. Uh, we've gotten lots of support so far with um, volunteers signing up, and um, I really appreciate uh, those who who uh, just say, assign me where needed, because we have many booths, and uh, it's kind of like a big puzzle to try and make sure that they're all covered. So if you're flexible, it really helps out that process, and, and all the... Um, the, the uh, other members who are taking care of, of special booths like refreshments and children's, we're all sharing the information. So um, please indicate if there are special booths that you want to help in. But if you just want to be flexible, um, we have many needs for that. And, and it, it appears that uh, the vendor solicitation is going well. Uh, we still have some space available, but lots of new vendors, lots of old vendors. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be a really nice show. I only oh. have two spaces left. Two. Oh, wow. Fabulous. Yeah. That's great. Can There's I put no in my two, two cents worth too? Can you hear me? Please, yes. Okay, um, this is Lori. Um, I'm doing the refreshment booth and I have so far 10 people have signed up for either making cookies and or working and we could use a lot more. So please consider that. If you can't be present for the show, but you'd like to contribute cookies, uh, let me know and I will arrange to pick them up or you can drop them off with me beforehand. That's not a problem. Um, if you can work a two hour shift Saturday or Sunday, it would really be helpful. Um, and I know there are a lot of other booths out there asking for help. Um, so please just reach out and do what you can. Thank you. So this is a, you know, it, it's, it's, it's always a hoot to me to think about um, uh, how important the cookies and the coffees are. And it's almost a thousand dollars of income to the show here for us. So uh, do not neglect your cookie cookie making <laughs> skills here. Let's see if we can push it well beyond a thousand dollars for this year. Any I'm other not, comments? Yeah. I was just gonna say, I'm not sure if this is true, but I, I believe it is that even if people are not signed up for cookies, a lot of them still bring them when they come to the show. Like sure. whenever they're coming to work, they just, oh, here's my cookies, you know, they don't, so hopefully a lot more than 10 will come. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the beautiful thing about this organization is it always, everything always works out. There's a dedicated group of people, whether they say they're going to do it or not. So I'm, I'm not concerned about yeah. that, but <clears throat> it would be helpful to know ahead of time, um, especially those that want to work, it would be help for, helpful in scheduling. But absolutely, it'll it'll all come together. See, because what Lori's not sharing is that there's actually a secret rivalry going on between Lori <laughs> and Terry in terms of are the cookies going to make more money than the planters? Right. This is the <laughs> this is the real challenge going on here. Again, after a two year hiatus, though, we're we're thrilled to be able to come back together. And it, uh, as Robin, as you mentioned here, that our vendors are thrilled to have this opportunity. 
Um, uh, this is a major economic development initiative for Grays Harbor County. And so it is a big effing deal. So everybody make sure we're on target for that. So uh, we're in a reminder again of this, um, of this, uh, of the uh, state conference coming up at the end of September. And it, um, and Kathy, you want to, um, Kathleen, you want to make a comment here is that uh, I know that, uh, you know, per our email exchange, we're still looking for uh, um, tour ideas and that, uh, and potentially that uh, our county could actually uh, um, sponsor a tour. Uh, yeah, and I think uh, Karen Russo and Sharon Golightly, the state reps, uh, would have a lot to say about it, but uh, they, uh, Candace Gohn, G-O-H-N, is, uh, as you might have seen in the email that was sent out, um, said we can still submit ideas if we could have, uh, and I'll let Sharon and Karen talk about it, but uh, we should probably uh, get that out to them uh, this week because the deadline was yesterday. Uh, anyway, uh, Karen and Sharon, would you like to add anything? Sure. Uh, one of the ideas that I ran by Karen and, and Kathleen was uh, a tour out to the Westport Winery. I think they've been a sponsor of ours and uh, they do serve food and uh, wine samples and maybe a stop at the sausage company there on the way or from. Um, but all the proceeds of a tour like this, we would put a price on it and tickets would be sold with a registration. And all the proceeds from that comes to our individual Grace Harbor Pacific County. Like last year, I rented out my house for a bed and breakfast and the proceeds of that came to our organization. So um, the amount of tickets are, that are sold come um, back directly to uh, Grace Harbor Pierce uh, Pacific. And so um, if you have any ideas that can be included in uh, maybe a four or five hour tour leaving at 11 from uh, Olympia that people could drive individually in cars out to Westport Winery and have a lunch or a snack and some wine. Uh, we want responsible drinkers, of course. Um, in any other venues in, the Westport area that people would might be interested in. Um, we need the board's approval to do this because uh, outlays of money or any finances would be borne by us at the at the front end of the um, tour, and whatever proceeds from that uh, we would uh, pocket as an organization. So I'll leave it to you all in the on the audience here to uh, consider if there's any uh, tour ideas I to reach out to either you know Karen, Kathleen, uh, or to Sharon Go Lightly here, and it um, and we can allow them to pursue that consideration as they move on. Reminder, of course, uh, from uh, both Alina and Brenda to get these hours uh, recorded uh, as we as we as we jump into this busy time as we've been talking about here with other events. There's going to be a lot of volunteer hours that we're all going to be contributing. You know, you know, speaking from experience, right? If you don't keep up on putting those hours into the give pull system, you know, you'll 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 be forgetful. You'll uh, you'll struggle to remember all the hours you contributed, and it uh, so it just it uh, it doesn't take long to get up there and make those clicks and get those hours in there. So keep up with them. Um, Alina, Brenda, any comments uh, with respect to how we're doing in terms of uh, keeping up with uh, keeping up with our hours? Uh, yeah, we have about 30 members that still haven't posted any hours yet. And Brenda and I don't know if what the reason is, but we're going to be following through um, to make sure it's not technology issues or, you know, we've had some people that have been posting hours and they're somewhere in the Ethernet because they didn't get into the right group. So we wanna make sure and recover those hours too and get people on the right path. So any comments or questions regarding hours, reach out to Alina, reach out to Brenda. We'll take it from there. Any other announcements? Any other announcements or questions here before we turn it over to Jake? Can I 
say one thing, uh, Kelly? Um, we're having this 50th anniversary for Master Gardeners in 2023, and we've been asked to submit, to tell our story from the different counties. So I'm gathering stories that people have um, about, you know, things that happened in the last 47 plus years. If you have photos, if you have videos, please send them to me so that I can forward them. I'd like to do that by the end of May. So it's just part of part of telling our story and our history as master gardeners. Thank you. Very good. So questions, you know, so comments, photographs, stories to Alina here uh, in anticipation of the 50th anniversary of the master gardener program in the state. Other announcements, comments? Uh, I forgot to mention that we have lots of postcard size uh, flyers that are really helpful to get the word out about the Home and Garden Show. Um, our members are our great source of, of publicity. So if, if you, if you have, are involved in other groups or see people or just want some of these to hand out to your friends and family, I would love to get you some. So email me and I'll figure out how to get them into your hands. Thank you. I, I have a question, Terry. Um, are, you, are you posting posters this year? Are we yes. posting posters? Okay. So how do we get those? Or do you have a committee already for, that, for posting them? I've ha I have some people that have volunteered to hang them up. If you want to help out, it would be great. Love to get you some posters. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay. So how many would you like? I'll email and where you. Do you want me to email okay. you? Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. I just have yes. a question. Terry, did you find someone in my area to help with them? Or is it me or in the Elma uh, area? Well, um, I so, can do Elma. This is Karen. Yes, Karen. Karen, and um, who's your who's your sidekick? You have a sidekick. And though. Helen. Helen. Yes. Ka Karen and Helen. <laughs> They're and Kath and perfect. Kathleen. We'll we'll take care of it. Bunch of posters. And and I can do others too. If you if you don't have somebody, I'm I'm willing to go south or whatever. We're both mobile. Yes, Great. sounds like a road trip. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. I posted the uh, in chat, by the way, I posted the at, uh, a, a PDF of the flyer that you saw in the earlier at, um, you know, in the earlier, uh, uh, in the earlier uh, show here. Very good. Any other comments or questions? I want to turn it over to, uh, to Jake here. And I'm going to stop my share. Kelly, Kelly, can you hear me? This is Barbara. Yes, Barbara. Yes. Hey, listen, I just wanted to do a reminder regarding the uh, the plant sale in July in conjunction with the uh, Home and Garden Show. And I'm, I'm sorry, not the Home and Garden Show, but the uh, uh, Garden, garden tour. tour. Yeah, Garden Tour. So uh, I just wanted to do a reminder for everyone that's uh, dividing plants and starting uh, plants. Uh, keep that in mind uh, for the, uh, the July plant sale. One gallon pots. And uh, I guess label them and more information will be forthcoming. That's an excellent reminder, Barbara. And I've already, I assure you, I've already got three dozen, you know, going for you here. So it, uh, yeah. you know, so this is a, this is a big deal in terms of it. Um, uh, Cause as, as we found in past sales, folks are eager, eager to purchase materials from uh, master gardeners. So it, uh, you know, this is a great time to divide, to, uh, to plant and to have stuff ready to go by end of July here for the, uh, for the tour. Okay, that's great. Other questions, other comments here? Jake, I've got, uh, you can go over and take a uh, message here. I wanna introduce, by the way, just to, while, we're getting, while we're getting settled here, is that uh, this, is a, this is a pretty cool time to have, uh, to have Jake here because it, uh, as, uh, as he and I have been chatting, most of our work as master gardeners is, that, uh, is gardening for specific, um, uh, uh, specific intent of, um, of human interest. And most of our work is to keep, uh, to keep pests like deer and, uh, and elk, and uh, in John's case, you know, cougar, 
out of the garden, you know, and it, uh, and here Jake has a whole responsibility to build a landscape and to build a garden for wildlife. So at uh, Jake, share your screen and introduce us to who you are and this unique responsibility that you have been entrusted with by this, uh, by Tacoma. Hi there. Can you hear me good? We can. <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you for inviting me out to do this. This is great. Um, yeah, so zoo horticulture is a pretty unique um, uh, sub uh, area of uh, horticulture um, that I fell into years ago. And uh, it's uh, pretty unique, as you say, um, to work with animals. Um, let me try to share the screen, make sure it works, and then I'll jump right into the presentation. Okay, can everybody see it okay? Indeed we can. Okay. All right, so um, as you introduced me, uh, my name is Jake Poole. I'm the horticulturist arborist uh, leader out at Northwest Trek. I've been here for about 15 years now at Northwest Trek and I was new to zoo horticulture. I originally was into introduction to new plants from around the world and doing like restoration projects and then did retail nurseries. So it was a kind of a different jump into it. And today, what I'm going to talk about is uh, the unique horticulture clients that we have um, that you spoke of. All right, so you guys are familiar where Northwest Trek is. It's out at Eatonville, Washington, um, so out towards Mount Rainier. Um, and I also provided also where USDA uh, zone 6B about, we're a little bit higher in elevation against the foothills, so we get a little bit colder. Um, our mission is uh, awakening and connection to uh, wildlife with everyone in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I, the map that I have provided there is showing kind of our area that are animals that are with at Northwest Trek because we specifically focus on animals of the Pacific Northwest. And then also the plant collection is also matching that same area. This is called the Cascadia bioregion. So all of our plants and animals match that. That doesn't mean that we won't have a few exotic plants uh, for use, but for the most part, um, it's all native here. So a little bit different than the normal zoo facility. And then kind of give you an idea of our uh, layout. Um, we have two and a half miles of trail system with individual exhibits um, that you can see on animals in a natural setting. We're sitting in an 80 year old Doug fir forest. Um, so a lot of it, we are lucky that we had an existing forest that it was built around versus a zoo that usually builds from the ground up. Um, and so basically a lot of the work that we do here is we augment the landscape and add more diversity and interest. Um, there's also uh, two and a half miles of trail system that's out in the nat natural areas that uh, doesn't have animals. And then on top of that, you have a tram or you can drive a car out in a 425 acre uh, free roaming area and that's interpreted. So then you get to see a lot of our hoof stock in that uh, larger exhibit. And that's mixed species, there's 125 animals in that one, uh, one exhibit. All right, so our unique uh, horticulture clients. Um, so they're kind of interesting, right? So we have um, quite a few, a few of the animals I work with here. We've got you know, the grizzly bears, uh, which are kind of our bigger contenders, get up to 800 to 1,000 pounds. We have a wolf pack, cougars, lynx, bobcat. We also have quite a bit of hoof stock. So we have moose on site, we have uh, birds. So we have quite a few uh, like bald eagles, golden eagles, uh, owls, turkey uh, vultures. Um, but, and then we also have like wolverines. So we have a lot of animals with a lot of teeth and a lot of hooves and a lot of weight, right? So it's, uh, and we have to deal with them. And one of our, uh, I also like to add in, as you see the children there with the pumpkins is the, one of our other main clients obviously is the client, the clients are the uh, people coming in. And so we're trying to find a way for people to connect with our animals. Um, and that's kind of the challenge is having a space that the animals can enjoy, but also creates an opportunity for the people. So it's not very different than working with humans. So I used to do landscape design, 
And working in the nursery trade, lots of people bring in their designs, right? And you get, you sit down with humans and you get to know them, right? What are their needs? What are their wants? What's the individual's interest? Um, so I kind of do the same thing with animals. Um, I observe the animals, get to know them, you know, different age animals of the same species act very different. Individuals act very different. So I get to know them quite a bit. Um, then I also understand what their wants and needs by sitting down with the keepers um, that work with them every day uh, and see uh, what interesting things they like, or do they like big leaf maple to chew on more than they like pine maple and um, things like that. And then also their capabilities. What does the animal want to do? Um, so in our spaces, some of our spaces are a quarter acre, um, up to a half an acre um, for the interior exhibits. Um, and so how do I utilize that space so that it's the most entertaining for the animal, for their health and, and, um, and their and mental, um, but also then how do I create it so that the people are standing at the view decks and going around the exhibits get to see the animals and enjoy the space. And then also just to create, um, we try to create wonder and opportunity for both the clients and the uh, and our animals and the visitors. And so we have a couple, a couple of unique ways that we've been doing that. So one of the ways that we do it is um, in design in our exhibits, we add furniture. So this isn't, you know, it's kind of a lot of things I do, I do, I pull in from what I learned in horticulture and outside areas. Also what I do in restoration sites, um, you know, we put in furniture. Furniture is basically anything animals can play on, climb on or use. Um, I do the same thing in restoration sites. We put down a lot of woody debris and material before we even plant the site. Um, and so the same thing happens to animal exhibits. So we put in this furniture and in our, our focus here at Northwest Trek is it has to be natural. And I don't want to see plastic balls or a sprinkler head or um, holding units in the back. So I spend a lot of time planting and adding furniture throughout the exhibit to make it look as natural as possible when you're viewing them. Um, and then also we try to create photo opportunities while we're putting in that. So um, for photo opportunities, I mean, is a landscape design that allows uh, animals and people um, to present photo ops. And so what I mean by photo ops or photo opportunities is things that animals are going to use and enjoy, because that's my main focus. And then if it so happens to create a great spot for the animal to be at, um, they're enjoying sunning themselves, but then it creates a great photo spot, then great. Then that adds to the, for the people. So some of the things, um, I, like when I say furniture, I have to put plants inside the exhibit. So you can see like the bobcat here, um, he likes to climb and doesn't have to climb on a very large plant. So we bring in vine maples and other uh, understory shrubs and trees and knowing that they're gonna climb on it. So I have to decide, is that plant, how much claws and chewing can that handle, right? Um, you know, will I break off branches? And then ultimately we'll get into it a little bit later, but you know, how could it create escape hazard if they climb up very high, right? So some of our plant, plants are existing like these trees, I have to allow them to climb in it. Now, as a horticulturist, when I first came into the zoo world, this was really difficult um, to watch, um, to have trees that are literally being clawed and climbed by a full-size cougar and, and uh, having it happening on a regular basis. And so we've learned to do is uh, in the zoo, zoos is we replant things, we plant replacements, um, we exclude animals from certain trees. So like this uh, Western red cedar, I'm allowing the cougar to go in it. We pruned it to create this and the cougar lights going up here because she's now 12 feet up in the air looking at the view deck. Makes her comfortable to watch people in the front, but it also create, creates a view opportunity. So it's comfort for the animal. The cedar is actually relatively handling it um, well, though the branches are getting worn. So we sometimes have to cut branches off. We sometimes have to top the trees if they get too tall that allows them access to upper canopy or to jump out. Um, so we have to manipulate the plants pretty heavily. Um, and sometimes it doesn't work out. So sometimes we'll have to remove them. Um, some of the trees are existing in here, like this big leaf maple. We allowed the uh, black bears to climb it. You can see the claw marks. You can see the branches arching down. Um, these are two young bears that never had seen trees before um, in their previous uh, zoo that they were at. Um, they were in a field basically with a telephone pole. So when they came here, they started climbing the trees, really enjoyed it. So we had to learn how to allow them to be in the trees. Now this tree, they eventually tore apart and dismantled a 40 foot maple tree. So that's you know kind of a hard thing to handle, right? Um, so some of the trees we allowed, some of them we put what's called metal flashing or hot wire. Um, so we'll put metal flashing that allows the bears not to bypass or we put uh, hot wire that's electric fence basically. And we put a few pieces of it around the base of the tree and that stops them from climbing up. 
Um, some of the larger trees can handle it. So like the black bear liked hanging out here. He would actually go into the crotch of this tree and fall asleep with his legs dangling down um, for the public. So it was pretty funny um, to see him using it that way. People would always call asking what, if the bear was okay. Now on a mature tree like this, it can handle the claw marks and the damage a little bit better. And these are kind of blurry photos. This gives you the idea of they're, they're up 20, 30 feet up in a tree fighting with each other and playing. And then like there he is sleeping, um, just barely woke up uh, in the maple. Um, something else that we'll do is, so a lot of it, like in our gardens, right? We look for structure. So when I first came to the zoo, I wanted to create structure in the animal exhibits. And so the first thing I did is like, I wanted to build things where the bears could access um, and play. So like this chunk of wood that he's leaning against is actually a 25 foot long old growth slab. So that's a fire from 1918 in our region. So we collect the old growth wood that we have if we're clearing parking lots, building roads or fences, none of that stuff gets wasted. We save it and then I bring in the exhibits. So like this one is actually built and rebarred into boulders. So this is kind of this interesting is as a gardener is I'm also doing construction, I'm building structure. I actually had to put 800 pound counterweight on the end also to keep the bears from flipping it. So it's those things that kind of blow your mind as a gardener is that you wouldn't have anticipated before. I just have to worry about people climbing on it, right? In a park system or a garden, but now I'm gonna have an 800 pound bear. But it creates this great opportunity, right? The keepers put things up on top of that slab. They sleep on it in the sun. I position it in a place where it's in the afternoon sun so they can warm themselves. Um, and it's also, there's a pool right below it. So they'll jump off of it into the pool. Um, we also do some pretty creative work of uh, making new snags. So sometimes I can't find the perfect piece, so I create it. So this is a hollow log um, that we cleaned out, um, and then I will light it on fire um, with a flamethrower, burn it, and then regrind it. And then I'll take buttermilk and water and moss, and uh, kind of like when you do it for your rocks, right, um, to add uh, to build, grow moss on rocks or stone walls. I do the same thing to our snags. So I respray it and get moss to grow on it. So you can see this idea is this creates opportunity. The raccoon wants to see the people. There's actually platforms and ladders built inside. You can't see that, but we added those in and that allows the raccoons to play with each other, run up and down it. Um, and it's right in front of the exhibit. Um, so it's easy to watch them take photos. And this piece will outlast any concrete that I'd be putting in. So normally we do gunite or other like concrete structures at Zeus. A piece like that would be twenty, thirty thousand dollars, um, and I'm utilizing pieces that we have on site. This will outlive the concrete; it just keeps aging. It's already 100. It's from 1918, so it's 100 years old and hasn't rot anymore since the day that it had fallen um, the, and, and exposed to fire. So, so these are kind of other things that we'll do. Um, this is another piece in the Wolverine exhibit. Same thing, creating opportunity, but also play for the animals. Um, it sets off the structure, so I'm planting behind behind that so there's green making sure it's in the sunlight just like in our gardens right it's just a little twist um, bringing in a burnt snag there's actually a hot rock that's sitting at the base of this that allows them to lay and stay warm during the winter so same thing I created a natural cavity that the animal would use so they're drawn to it but it has a heated rock and so and it's also viewable for photos and also to see the animal so if it's a cold winter day they're still viewable and then sometimes uh, some of these snags that we bring in, the animals utilize them to hide from the other, other animals. So same thing, creates this great opportunity. So this snag is actually this snag. So it gives you an idea is he's sitting up in the top here and the same thing, I've got platforms and ladders. Um, I actually taken the snag and cut it and burned it so that sunlight comes through the back so you can see the animal. Here's a cat, cat uh, holding unit area or um, like a cave that was built um, that has a hot rock, but then I take it and put natural wood on it, on it and allows the cougar to display natural behavior, but also it hides the cave, right? So it's the same thing as like how I approach things in gardens. I don't wanna see water spigots and back control panels and other things, right? You wanna have uh, any of that utility stuff hidden. I do the same thing with our animal exhibit. So a lot of what I learned through school and when I did master gardeners 20 years ago is you know landscape design is, how do you hide the things? So now I just bring it into the zoo world. Some of our bigger exhibits, you see the woody, um, woody pieces that we brought in. These are old growth poles in our eagle exhibit. They're snags that we built. Um, we all did this with natural wood instead of concrete, um, but it gives this immersive experience. Also creates this, uh, this is a little bit of um, contrast to the photos, is that, but the 
eagle can perch up on top above the people and see and they can see them up close so it allows the animal to be comfortable but then it also you can enjoy it looks natural right and then sometimes it's just simply finding a hollow rotten log um, and cutting it off um, and using it in an exhibit that creates an opportunity now the animal feels safe and it's surrounded by nice green plants in the exhibit but it gives a great photo too this is another look at that bare log also and so you can see he's debating if he's going to jump into the pool or not. Um, also, uh, we do positioning of like rocks. Um, so it's kind of another interesting thing is rocks, just like in, uh, um, in, in gardens, right? They need to be in spots where they can be enjoyed. Um, they'll pick up heat, you know, like it will grow moss. So I like I positioned this rock, uh, brought it in when we renovated the exhibit. It's in a spot that gets sunlight during the highest, busiest time. Um, and so in the winter time, the animals lay up on top, but it also grows moss on it because it's shaded in the morning and the afternoon. We actually added licorice ferns around the edge of it since this photo, but it brings animal allows them to get up high and see the people, but it also it allows people to see the animal, right? Same thing in the Wolverine exhibit, same idea. You can see a lot of our exhibits are pretty lush. And so I'm always planting things in the exhibits that I see in natural areas, but it has to be something that's not toxic and also something that um, can regrow from being damaged because these guys play pretty rough. Um, so I have to allow them to chew, right? I can't exclude the exhibit or it's kind of pointless to have an exhibit if I have to put hot wire up and exclude them from all the plants. So it's kind of that hard new thing that I had to embrace when I came into zoos. Um, sometimes we're doing like hazard tree placement too. So as I'm also the arborist on site, so we drop a lot of trees inside the exhibits or we'll bring in arborists to climb and drop them. And so like this, there was a stump from a windblown tree. And then I had the arborist drop these other trees across the stump to create this uh, logs going across the stump. And then we added a platform. So now the wolves love going there because they can get up high, watch people, but then they're running up and down the logs back and forth in the exhibit. And um, so people can see them, um, it creates routes for the wolves. This is getting to know your client is that uh, wolves like um, circuits or routes. And uh, kind of like, have you ever seen a dog in a dog kennel, right? They go around the edge of it or your yard. If you, grit, if you provide them with something like this, like a log to run on, they'll jump up on the log and use it as part of their circuit instead of running across the ground and making it muddy. So it's something that as I observed and learned about other canids or dogs, we added it with the wolves and it works really well. So every time there's a hazard tree, a tree that dies from laminated root rot or a tree that gets damaged by windstorms, we'll come back in with pulleys and tackle and lift them and swing them into position. And so like this one is a newly installed one where the bear's testing it out. Um, so the grizzly um, is one of the hard things is, is we drop these trees is the grizzlies are the roughest, right? So we have to constantly replace things. Some of these logs, the Grizzlies um, are going to tear apart as there's termites and uh, other bugs in it. So we'll have to replace them eventually versus some of the other exhibits that last a lot longer. <coughs> Excuse me. Some of our bigger challenges that we have um, in some of our exhibits is I put on here as moose is our giraffe. So our moose in our free roaming exhibit is the tallest grazing animal that we have. So I have to design everything to based on our draft. It's like, that's our draft of our exhibit. It's basically the, the moose can eat eight to nine feet tall up above it. So I have to provide fencing or excluding from planting new trees in the exhibit um, by um, based on that height. Um, they're also smart enough to go out when it rains or when there's snow, then the new branches are lowered down and they go out and uh, scope and look for things. So they'll graze things even higher. Um, pretty smart. Um, I've got, you can see this is bark debarking that happens on our cedar trees from the moose in the springtime. And so we started putting chain link on them. And you can see here's the like browsing height of our moose. You can see that behind it on the tree. We also have to deal with elk and the same thing. So not only do I have to plant a tree, I have to keep the moose for their height and their bark eating wants. Um, the elk want to scrape the trees. So I have to exclude the elk from the trees. Then I have the goats that are the acrobats. They're the ones that climb over the top of the logs. So in an exhibit, um, what I'll have to do is I plant trees and then I put stumps and logs around it. And the first thing that happened when I first did that, the goats climbed over that, but none of the other animals could get to it, right? So then it's like, okay, 
now I have to understand my new client uh, and his and his wants to get in there. So we put chain link around the plants, the tree, with the logs around it. Now the goat can't get to the the tree. The tree's protected, and we also had to design it so that the bison doesn't get to it either, because the bison can is a couple thousand pounds and can push a log or uh, whatnot. So I have to put big enough pieces. So we end up doing these planting, and I don't have the photo of it, but we plant clusters of trees with logs and stumps around them with the fence. And now the bison rub on the trees and the goats are climbing on the logs, but they can't get to the trees and we can actually establish new trees in the exhibit. Um, this is kind of what I do also in restoration sites um, outside of our animal um, habitats. Um, I have problems with elk and deer um, coming in, especially in rut season with the uh, elk. And so I put a lot of woody debris down throughout my restoration sites because elk and deer don't like climbing over things as much if they have other food options. Um, so if I can make it brushy, so we take a lot of our uh, trees that we take down and um, brush and we just add it to the restoration sites. It makes it look messy, but it works really well because then the animals just follow the pathways and the roadways and graze along those and they don't try to jump into the restoration sites and get the plants. All right, so I talked about a little bit about in zoos, we have these special words that we say. So we have like browse and enrichment. So browse is meaning things that are fed to them that are for dietary and nutritional items. Like they're actually gonna use them and utilize them, right? To, for uh, food intake. Um, enrichment are items that can be plants, but um, it's plants that are not really consumed for nutrition. It's more for fun. Um, so some browse can be enrichment. So if that makes sense. So that's one of, that's the bread and butter of a zoo horticulturist is we supply a lot of plants for the, not only do we do landscape design, but we're also expected to supply branches from our pruning um, to our animals, especially a lot of our herbivores that wanna eat. But we also um, provide it to the bears and the wolves and other animals for play so that they don't go after the landscape. So this gives the idea of like a browse list that we have. So this is all native plants that are approved. So I have to review everything for toxics, uh, if it's toxic, um, how much they can eat, and then we eventually move it towards an approved browse list. So these are a lot of the same plants I'll use in the exhibits with the canids or like or the carnivores, um, but I also will use them in our rest our our hoofstock uh, exhibits also. Um, but then I'll put that in those fenced off areas. So I'll plant roses that run underground and will sprout out past those logs and provide browse for the animals. Um, I pl plant a lot of things along fence lines that allow the animals to graze as soon as it comes through the fence. Um, so I'm always thinking is not do I, I don't want to destroy the plant, but how can I have it so it provides a continuous browse without me bringing it to them. So there's a little bit more list of plants, but we do also do non-native plants. We do uh, provide bamboo in the winter because it's really hard to have foliage for the animals in the winter. And turns out bamboo is actually quite nutritious. Um, it's uh, spikes in nutrition during the winter before it shoots. Um, so we provide a lot of bamboo and also the canes are used for enrichment for toys. Um, we do have to watch on what we allow the animals to eat and how much. Um, we provide pumpkins and squash, you know, the fruits, the flowers, you know, the foliage. Um, are all edible. And so all, all the different animals goes out. Sometimes it's just like osmanthus, so a common garden plant, right? But it's that sweet scent, you know, um, is inter interesting to animals. So, so we'll provide, we have some in some land, uh, outer landscapes, we provide branches of that. This gives you ideas, kind of the fun things that we do with some of the native plants with animals. Um, this is a birthday for the porcupine. And look through all this, this uh, all these different plants and try to ID them. Um, they're uh, you know all native plants, the Pacific Northwest that were growing on site. Some are cultivars, but these are all edible plants for this, this is a birthday porcupine um, cake. Um, so it's kind of fun. You, know, you get to do uh, uh, floral arrangements in the zoo world too. Um, I do a lot of floral arrangements for weddings and other things also using only native plants. Um, I'm a kind of a purist since we're a native you know animal part. And Kelly, can I give you a request to let me know when I'm um, down to the last 10 minutes? Oh, you're doing you're doing great here. And I tell you this, and, um, and obviously I want to encourage everybody, if you have questions you want to share to Jake, just shout it out or use the chat. Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely pay attention to the chat and then uh, point them out if I miss them. And there'll be Q&A at the end also. All right, so then some of the other things I do is, so I'm big into foraging and, allow, and having people eat uh, plants. And so a lot of the plants that I have in the public areas are edible. Um, and we'll interpret them and do uh, classes sometimes. 
but I also have a lot of edible stuff that's planted throughout the landscape that I can just simply cut and hand to the keepers to provide to the animals. It's pretty fun. It's one thing when you get a tray from, you know, Cisco Foods, you know, that's like cafeteria, like vegetables and fruit, like a school or a business gets in a tray. But if I can provide a branch with different ripenesses of fruit and I can hand it to them and they can have to figure out how to manipulate around the thorns and pick the fruit off, that's a lot more enriching and fun for the animal. And it's more of natural behavior versus being provided you know, a, a plate full of uh, mixed fruit, like a fruit bowl, right? So I have all these different plants all throughout that I can cut and, and provide. So like this is black cap raspberry. Um, some of the things I do in the exhibits is kind of interesting is we'll plant flowering plants and fruiting plants, but it's actually not for the animals a lot of times. So these are, some of these things are in our uh, bobcat exhibit or lynx exhibit um, or they're adjacent. The idea is it brings in other wildlife. So I'm always, the exhibit starts as soon as you climb out of the car at Northwest Trek. And the same thing around the exhibits. I want fruits and flowers and diversity. Um, so it brings in all kinds of different wildlife. So how fun is that for the animals when they get to see, you know, mason bees, butterflies, hummingbirds all active around them. Um, also then when the, the seasonal fruit is on all the different migratory birds that are coming through. So now I'm creating something for the people and the animals, um, where they get to see this activity all around them versus a sterile, uh, zoo, zoo exhi uh, exhibit that you need see at an older zoo. A lot of times, um, I'm always just trying to create interesting things. Um, we also add in the people into it. So we do a pumpkin partnership with the local school. Um, we have like a greenhouse program we developed years ago and the kids grow our pumpkin starts for us. And then they come out and plant them on site and we grow them. And then next year, um, some of the kids come back and harvest and put them in the exhibit. Um, and so they're all pumpkins that are uh, nutritional, um, high nutritional value, heritage varieties. Some of them are unusual pumpkins um, where they're like, um, they don't have seed coats. They're naked. They're called naked pumpkin seeds. Um, so when you open them up, they're just a pumpkin seed without the shell. So I can provide that to some of our older animals that can't bite and break the shells. So it's kind of a fun thing. So it's a way of connecting nutrition and understanding uh, for people, but also how it helps the animals. And then those pumpkins store for months, a lot of these varieties. So we'll put them in the exhibits. So it's not only just the pumpkin that's fun for the people um, and, and for the animals, but it's also the animals really enjoy is they come off exhibit the animals and then I have those kids running around the exhibit that's empty now and they're touching things and so I have them running through the wolf exhibit and the bear exhibit rubbing trees and touching things because the animals that's enrichment to them the scent of new people that they've never smelt before and came in contact so the kids are running around putting out all these treats and different things hiding them up on things and then we uh, bring the kids back out put them out in the view deck and then we release the animals. I do the same thing when I'm planting in the exhibit or uh, getting rid of invasive plants. Um, before we leave, we go and touch a bunch of stuff and make it interesting. I have volunteers that work with me and, season, and seasonal employees and all those new people that are not regulars to the animals. It's fun. So we'll add them into the wolf exhibit and you'd be surprised. You wouldn't think wolves would like uh, pumpkins, but they enjoy chewing on them. And there's also just running around with them and keeping away from the other wolves and also climbing up to get to them. Um, we're also creative about um, what we provide. So something that I realized is, you know, I'm a big hiker um, and out in nature, I'm a naturalist at heart. Um, so, you know, obviously we see logs that have been ripped open by bears, right? Like out in the wild and they're getting termites and grubs. So when we have rotten trees that have carpenter ants or termites, I, I reviewed the toxicology of it, provided it to our curators and they approved us to be able to bring logs in full of termites. So this is really fun for the bears, you know, and especially if I have to bring it in with a loader, uh, like a one ton log that's rotten, drop it in and they'll tear it apart in one day. Um, but also we can provide that into our foxes and our uh, other insectivore, you know, um, uh, species that uh, will eat, you know, insects. So our skunk, um, the raccoon. So I also do Western tent caterpillars. Turns out they're not toxic. They just, uh, they're, they're just fuzzy and uh, uh, anyways, they're fun and interesting. So we'll, when we're cutting webs that are in the way or in a, in, or a problem, or I'll just, I'll cut a few. So every five to seven years, we get these te uh, Western tent caterpillars. We'll provide this to the animals and it's fun from the dig through the webbing. Also I have on their surf and turf. So we have fish that are in our moat system. Um, so they, they are part of the moat system and they get pretty big. And we've watched the cats trying to reach them from the shore but they never get a really good chance. So we worked with the curators and the keepers is like, well, how far can I go over the water um, that doesn't create a danger for the cat to jump out, right? And so we started installing logs 
above the water. We also started planting swamp grasses and other aquatic plants so that it makes it a great fish habitat and for insects also, but it allows the cats to come out, sit on the logs and actually fish for the fish that were already naturally there that they've always wanted to get a hold of. So every once in a while they get a hold of the fish. So how awesome is that for the keep or for the visitors to come through and they get to see the animal in their natural habitat enjoying going after fish. And I like to point out also is a lot of that woody do stuff is that's the things that I normally am cutting up and we're usually hauling off. Um, we don't haul anything off on site. I've kind of closed our nutrient loop for our 725 acre park. So no trees, no rocks, no dirt leaves the site pretty much. Um, if there's a construction job, we reutilize it and use it somewhere else. The, all the wood gets stored and it gets re-put back out um, into other areas if it can't go where it was at. Um, we don't haul any material off anymore um, and we have our own compost. Um, and then we chip a lot of the wood too and use it on restoration sites. So it's kind of like how I approach my gardening is I don't want to, I don't want to go buy synthetic fertilizer if I don't have to, if I already have natural products, I put down woody debris because the woody debris rots and becomes a sponge in our landscape, right? It actually holds water and gives it back, provides nutrients. Um, you know, uh, it, I'm a pretty strong organic farmer or farmer and um, gardener and so I want to create, um, you know, it's kind of nice that we have these natural areas. And so I allow the leaves and the debris to build up um, and don't rake and clean everything up other than in main areas and mount in the building. Um, and so it's kind of utilizing what we have. And instead of considering it waste is trying to reutilize it in the exhibits. Um, we pack in leaves to the bears um, so they can have fall leaves to play with. Um, we'll let them mildew a little bit, you know, in big piles and then bring them into the animals because that's a new scent. So the fresh, you know, fresh leaves. So it's just trying to be creative on how to use it. Um, so some of the other stuff is uh, some of the browse is not, it's not always browse, it's just enriching. So a lot of our uh, conifers are enriching to a lot of animals because it's really strong scented, right? Pitchy wood, woody plant. Same reason why your elk and your deer like scraping those trees because it's pitchy and, and uh, has that strong scent. Um, they like that on their antlers. Well, the same thing works for a lot of our bears and wolves is they want that scent. So when we cut down or limb things up, we provide that to the animals. And it's something for them to play with. So they may not eat it, but they'll still play with it. Um, and then some of the material, the bears actually like take the sore turns that we cut back or some of the dug fir branches, they pull it into their den and then use it as denning material um, in their exhibit to sleep on. So, and they actually, we allow our bears to dig their own dens inside the exhibit. So um, it's kind of an interesting way of using um, plants that normally I would have hauled off, right? That's giving ideas like this is just a vine maple branch that was given to the bear and became a perennial favorite. And uh, so he pulls it into the pool and plays with it and swings it around. So it looks like he's using it as a walking stick, but he'll throw it in the air and play with it. And the bears fight over it. And it's just one of those funny things where normally that would have just been considered a cut off chunk of wood that we would have got rid of. And it turns out it's really something that they enjoy. So now we look for things that are knotty and hard that could resist the bear's strength and they can play with that's natural. And you can see on the bottom of the photo too, is there's, a, there's logs that we have in the water floating. So they'll add logs and then they'll drill holes in it and put like food inside the holes and it's floating and they have to like jump in the pool and swing around and like pull the food out with their nails. So it's utilizing that natural product that we have on site. And Jake, this is probably an opportunity when you have that bear picture. Uh, we had a question from Chris talking about, you know, how you actually get in and work in these habitats with animals that actually want to kill you. Yeah, so that's a great question. So, um, yeah, so that's one of the one things a lot of people ask, right? So most of our animals have holding units that they can be transferred into. So they're like back areas um, that are uh, enclosed. So like the bears have a concrete den, basically, that has stainless steel gates that can drop down and they have hammocks inside and like treats and food. So they're trained to want to come there when they get they hear a whistle um, or if they hear the keepers working in the back, they'll move in there because they know they're going to get a special treat like a salmon or um, some kind of snack bar, you know, like uh, that's for the bears or that I've already dropped off plants for them. And so they'll shift there, go into their holding units. And once it's secure, then we're allowed to go in. Um, and then we turn off the hot wires because there's hot wires running around most of our exhibits on the outside so they can't climb out. And then we'll do all of our work inside. Um, most of our exhibits, um, we don't have contact with the animals. Um, our old wolf pack, we used to have to work inside because they wouldn't shift. Um, and so we'd have to have a couple keepers with us and they would keep them away from us while we're on our hands and knees working and like planting trees. And the wolves would 
they're not aggressive, but they would be, you know, jumping at and playing and wanting to be next to us because we're something new. Um, some of other exhibits like the free roaming exhibit, I can't, the animals can't be pulled off exhibit. So we have to deal with animals. So it's dealing with the rut season, knowing the behaviors, checking in with the keepers. So when I get out to drop a tree, I have to have a second person site for me before I drop 180 foot dead fur that there's no animals underneath, but then also is it clear before I release the tree? You know, because it turns out now um, I'm the guy that um, was running the chainsaw. That's a dinner bell to the moose and uh, a lot of the other uh, herbivores. So they hear that chainsaw fire off in their exhibit, they run towards us because they know that means that there's lichens, moss, branches coming down, you know, all kinds of cool things. And then just also interesting scent. So a lot of times we have to hurry up, do our cut and then move um, to the next one and uh, drive on. I can't work in a, a specific area for very long unless the keepers can pull them away. So yeah, it's kind of a interesting. There's some special seasonal challenges you have because um, you're, you're up nestled up against the cascade. So you're kind of in a higher elevation, you know, but it, uh, but it, uh, and I know you had a lot of storm damage this past winter. You had to work yeah, with. Um, this was a rough year. So we've had a couple of wind storms last week, Monday, we had 11 trees come down and like, you know, 20 minutes of high winds and then had another gust and more trees come down that, that evening. Right now, actually, I'm looking out over our lake and it's snowing right now where I'm at. Um, so even though, cause we're up against the foothills, um, I can drive 10 minutes away to my house and it won't be snowing properly. Um, so yeah, we, uh, we have a, a little bit extra weather that you guys won't have out towards the coast. Um, it's pretty common to snow and rain here when it's not um, normal. It's supposed to be a nice day. Um, the animals, like when they're in rut, like the bison, they're pretty mean. They'll go after the loaders because they don't like the loud noise of the motor. So like we're on a loader going out there to carry logs and the bison bulls are start wandering over to us to go uh, push against the loader and run us off. Um, the elk bulls, um, when they're in rut, the lead bull protects the cows well, guess what? A truck is, uh, they think is a threat when they're full of hormones. So when I drive out, the bull walks alongside our truck and keeps us away from the cows so we don't steal them. Um, <laughs> so we have to like keep our distance and, and pay attention. And sometimes we just can't do our work during when they're, if we have a really mean individual, um, we may have to, you know, move on as soon as we see them. Um, we used to have animals, as soon as they'd see us, they would run towards you, put their antlers down and go after you um, during rut season. So right now we, we have a pretty good mix of animals, but yeah, it's interesting. Um, so another thing, food and play is it's enriching. So another, it's the same thing. I have flowers and fruit, we wanna bring in hummingbirds, um, but then also then the fruits available, the bears will actually pick the salmon berries off in the, and if I can get salmon berry growing, that's one that they, they will smash and chew on, but it actually does fruit and flower in our exhibit, um, at least in the black bear exhibit. Um, our grizzly exhibit, the bears are, uh, still teenagers. And so they're acting like teenagers and smashing a lot of things. So we're having a hard time keeping plants going in there. Um, in the spring, a lot of stuff sprouts up um, and we'll have foliage, but they'll eat the new shoots of the salmon berry. So, but also it brings in birds, chipmunks, there's rabbits in the exhibit inside the carnivore exhibits. They get, they get in and live in there and they become part of the enrichment also is, um, and the animals will try to catch them and play with them. But most of the time they don't because the animals know they're there. Um, also, it just seems, you know, something so simple, right? But like planting uh, herbaceous perennials and trees that bring in butterflies and bees. It's interesting to the animals. They, they chase them and play with them. And um, so it's nice as um, not only am I adding diversity and helping the insects out, but it also the whole exhibit is surrounded by all these different plants that bring in lots of animals. Also like skunk cabbage. I like skunk cabbage. I think it's pretty, it's pretty strong scented, right? But that's interesting for the animals. So a lot of our moats now have skunk cabbage planted in it. It looks pretty. And when you look down on it, when you're viewing the animals, but also that scent is interesting to the wolves. It, it's a seasonality, a change, right? So it's not the same. So we try to add in things like that. And sometimes these, uh, some of the plants I can put in the exhibits and sometimes the animals want to go after them. So I have to know that if the animal is going to chew that and eat that, that that could be a toxic or damaging, right? So skunk cabbage, if you eat it, it's like eating glass crystals. Um, it'll cut up your digestive tract. So we don't put that in some animal exhibits that would dig at it, right? Um, sometimes it's just uh, like in our kids' play area and in our rain gardens and uh, restoration sites, um, I have lots of flowering plants and I'll collect seeds. And then I go around into the animal exhibits and throw the seeds about in, in similar habitats um, to see what will take and grow. And that works pretty good. So we'll use like, this is scarlet um, 
monkey flower that I use in the kids kid uh, bog area um, garden, um, but I'll throw it in our wet areas. Um, I use Indian plum. Indian plum actually is toxic. It has cyanide in it. it smells like almonds, you know. Um, but it, uh, it a lot of animals don't like it. This has a displeasing flavor. So even though it's toxic, they don't mess with it. So it's kind of like when I do with my landscapes is making sure that I don't put plants in an exhibit that, you know, or an area where the public can access. I have to pay attention to what fruits out there too, right? So I kind of treat it the same as I do with people. Um, I also add a lot of fruiting plants into the exhibits and then all along the trails. And so I want the, you know, the animals and the migratory birds um, but I have to know my plants, just like in your garden is most of these are edible um, and are fine, but like the cascara, the top right, um, that's a laxative. That's not something I want people to eat. So I, in the core, I plant our core area where the public's at, they're planted and I have them as understory trees, but I limb them up so the kids don't, um, aren't interested in trying to get berries. Um, but also brings in cedar wax wings and other species. And I've been also starting to install them in the animal exhibits too, the ones that won't eat it. Um, obviously I can't put in herbivore exhibits because then it's a laxative. So I have to know those things, um, but it adds an, another interest, right? Um, other thing that we uh, like are wolves. They like chewing on everything. They're like a dog, right? Um, and they're really excited and interesting. Um, so we did a study years ago um, with the animal keeper. Um, we did a um, like a control plot. Well, basically our problem is, is we go into these exhibits and the keeper does this is the keeper goes in the exhibit, takes like scents, you know, fish oils and like food and hides them under logs, climbs over things, you know, gets creative. So it's fun for the wolves to find, right? Well, and it's, and it seems great until as a horticulturist, I come in with my crew of, you know, and they may, the animals may know me, but not the volunteers that are helping me. And then I go and I try to put the plants underneath logs and hidden places where the animals won't find them or chew them right away. And then it's basically, we've trained the animals to go hunt and seek everything that's new. Um, well, that's what happens with my plants. And so we were really having a problem in our wolf exhibit. And so we were like, okay, how could we make it so we could plant in our animal exhibits that I could get them to leave it alone for the week that it's interesting. Um, the wolf keeper told me that after a week, most things aren't cool anymore, the scent. So if I can keep them off it for a week, great. I don't want to put hot wire up. So we ended up doing is like, you can see the photo here is our exhibit was pretty bare in the winter and I wanted to plant sword ferns and I want the public when they're standing there looking, there's a wall of sword ferns and then that log and then there's a play area for the wolves. So, so the exhibit doesn't have to be planted fully, but it has to look full to the, uh, to the public, right? But it still gives space to animals. So what we ended up finding out is by doing a control of me planting or the keeper planting, um, and then recording how many deaths there was. We also used wolf urinated bedding. So they just put straw in the holding units and the wolves like to urinate on it. Well, guess what? They don't like their urination. No, they're not attracted to it. So if we sprinkle that around the plants after we install them, before we leave, the wolves leave it alone for five to seven days because um, it's not interesting. And so it ended up being a key to it. Also, we found out that it wasn't popular. Is we found out if keepers plant it because they're so used to the keepers, um, we get higher success rate. And guess what? The keepers didn't want to do the gardening for us. So we ended up uh, using the wolf urination bedding stuff and it's worked really well. Well, it turns out it works in cat exhibits too. So this ended up being kind of a groundbreaking study for us. And so we actually shared it at national conferences and, and traveled around sharing this to other zoos because this has been a huge issue. And so at least for canines and some cats, this works. So now we're able to take a product that normally would just get thrown in the compost pile and we'll utilize it now and bag it and then put it around the plants when we install it. And this worked pretty well. Um, I talked about a little bit of toxicology. So kind of like what you do in your own gardens, right? Like people ask, you know, is that flower poisonous? Is that leaf poisonous? You know, is that fruit okay to be there, right? Especially in our public garden spaces, you know, that we're inviting the public into versus our personal gardens sometimes will be a little bit more riskier. <coughs> I have to do all the toxicology on site. So basically what I do is I just look up what alkaloids and what the symptoms are, um, what part of the plant's poisonous. And I provide that to our veterinarian and curator staff, animal staff. Um, so a lot of them are you know, plants that you all recognize that are quite toxic. Um, some of them are just, they, uh, like foxglove. We have it all over our free roaming area in that 425 acres. Animals don't eat it. And so 
we think luckily don't have to control it um, or that'd be a lot of work, um, but we allow it in there. I still don't like it because it's not native, but if they ate it, it's a huge cardiac, you know, uh, chemical. Um, use, of course, uh, use or no nos and zoos. So I can only have a few native uh, U plants that I have in protected spots so that even a customer can't break the branch off and throw it in an exhibit thinking that they're going to feed the beaver or do something fun. Um, I have to have some of these toxic plants out of reach. Some of our invasive plants are pretty bad. Yellow flag iris. There was so much yellow flag iris when I came here in the wetlands because it had been a tried and true plant in the wetlands for so long. People thought it was native. A lot of the current staff before I came on thought it was native. So we went around pulling all the yellow flag iris because it's not native and it's very invasive and it's toxic also. And so we spent a lot of time pulling that out. Of course, tansy ragwort, we have to pull and get rid of. Um, we have water hemlock, the native one, um, which doesn't seem like much of a um, an issue, except it's the third most poisonous plant in the United States. Um, it's actually quite toxic. Uh, 12 ounces of uh, green material will kill a horse in 15 minutes. Didn't know that until I came into the zoo world. I just knew to stay away from it when I was weed whacking. And it was a native on top of it. So we have a lot of wetlands that grows in. And it'll grow seven foot tall when it's happy. And some of our peat bogs. And so this is one of our crew um, well, was pulling it. So we have to go through a bog um, that's a couple of feet deep of water um, in our free roam area and pull all of it. And so I hate pulling a native plant. It bothers me to have to do that, but I have no other option. The, the, the moose and other animals will wait out there even in the winter or in the spring when it starts sprouting and they're interested in it and it has a celery-like scent. So we have to pull it. So we have to wear safety gear and make sure we don't get the juice on us or in our eyes. And we have to wait out into the exhibit Moose, of course, thinks that's great. You can see there's one flowering right in front of the moose as she's like wondering what we're doing out in the middle of the swamp. So we're out in, you know, knee deep, waist deep water and the moose is coming out. So we'll have to call the keeper and ask him to move the moose along. And we have to just kind of keep our distance. Um, this time of year, they're not um, in the spring. They're not in ruddy uh, interest. So we just pull the plants, pull them off site, put them in bags, keep them away from them. Um, but yeah, it's kind of pretty toxic plant. Um, here's a little bit more of some of the other plants that can be a problem. Um, one that was kind of interesting was English holly. Um, English holly is everywhere. Same one that a lot of people thought, a lot of the locals think it's native because it's everywhere in the foothills out here. And it was also in the exhibits and they thought it was great because it was naturally occurring because the birds had brought it in. And uh, it was in the exhibits and the bears wouldn't eat it. Well, I started looking at the uh, alkaloids and turns out the alkaloid and it's the same alkaloid that is similar to chocolate or yerba mate. Well, that's really hard on dogs, right? Like you can't give chocolate to dogs. Turns out the English holly is a lot of the holly family has uh, this alkaloid in it. So we had to go through and anywhere the wolves are at or going to be moved into exhibit, we had to pull all of it um, because when they're young, they like chewing on the plants and we don't know how much it will take. Just like you don't know how much chocolate will kill a dog you hear, you know, so we have to take the uh, precautionary principle of just pulling it just in case. So that was kind of a new surprise one, right? A lot of our, uh, our, our garden plants that we love turn out to be quite toxic. That's why we love them because they don't have holes chewed in them and they don't have um, issues with insects. Well, you know, a lot of them, you know, like English laurel and other, other plants, they're, they're full of cyanide and toxins. Um, there's a reason why they don't get browsed by deer often or, you know, beat up. So I have to watch for those things coming into our exhibits. Another one that's kind of a surprise is uh, gra uh, grass toxin. So I don't know if you, any of the horse people are in the group, but horse people know about this because um, you have to not allow horses to graze on lawn grass. Um, it'll actually could poison them. It has what's called endophytes in it. Um, that was a new one for me too. When I went to go buy grass seed, um, I started reading up before I went to put seed out in the exhibits when I first came in and I wanted to look natural. And then I found out that this endophyte, it's basically... It's uh, beneficial fungi living within the plant. Um, well, it turns out 90% of all of your garden or your uh, lawn seed is uh, got endophyte infected because it helps the plant handle uh, drought. Insects don't eat it because it's toxic slightly um, and it's resistant to fungal diseases. So almost all of our lawn seed is bred to have endophytes or have been selected for endophyte in it. Um, well, I can't put that out in a lot of exhibits that have herbivores or I could poison them if they eat enough volume. Um, same thing with like perennial ryegrass. You can get ryegrass stagers where the animal eats so much they act like they're drunk and will eventually have issues. Um, the endophytes are quite toxic. So 
we luckily found an around, uh, workaround is you can get a pasture mix at a feed store and it's for horses, it's endophyte free. When we first found out about endophytes and the zoo was uh, zoo world was kind of sharing it and learning about it because there was a couple deaths over a decade or two ago, um, we were having to buy endophyte free seed. Well, 350 to $450 for 50 pounds of seed um, to have it uh, certified at an Oregon library or, or Oregon lab um, down in Oregon. So, uh, we were really happy to find out that you know horse mix already has it done for you. So something just that you know wouldn't even have thought of, right? You're just going to add some grass seed to muddy area, yeah. Um, so some of the hazards that we have: um, the animals themselves, of course. We talked about that. Um, they can be their own hazard um, for us. Um, they also can create hazards. Um, you know, grizzly bears are quite large. They can dig and uproot things, push things over, so they can push it against their fences and uh, and create escape routes. Um, we also were pretty heavily forested landscape. And so like, you know, we have wind storms and all the trees that blew down last Monday were all just trees in wet areas. They were perfectly healthy. They didn't even have laminate root rot. And we had, you know, 150 to 200 foot dug firs fall over. Um, and so that creates a big issue, right? So a lot of animals get put away when there's sustained winds over 25 miles an hour. Um, but this one was a surprise. We had winds at 10 to 15 miles an hour and all of a sudden we had 67 mile an hour gusts for 15 minutes. So we had to like evacuate the park of people and trees were coming down. None of them hit exhibits, but we have to go around and the keepers are trying to put the animals back in their holding units. And I'm listening for trees falling and keepers are watching, everybody puts on their hard hats, but then we're scrambling around making sure that fences don't bre get breached. And it does happen sometimes. Luckily, most of our animals want to stay in um, anyways. Um, or if we know that there's high winds scheduled, like then the grizzly bears, any of the leaf animals, cougars, they get put away ahead of time um, versus like the raccoons, others will be able to be out for a while unless the winds get really high. But so yeah, our moose are a problem. This is some of the wind blown trees. So like you can see the size of the tree that's blew over on Monday. It was a 30 inch dug for um, peeled up. Um, and then the other one is just along a road. Of course, the utility lines get put in. Always think about when your gardens, when people are putting in utility lines, like what's, you know, they'll just say, oh, we're just going down 18 inches. Well, guess what? That's where all the roots are at in a lot of our glacial till areas. Um, that we had a fiber optic line that was put in there 10 years ago and it peeled up right along the fiber optic line. Um, I couldn't, didn't have control of having them go underneath the, the roots. It's always worth to go under the roots. I, you know, I fight a lot for that and making it sure it's in our contracts. And a lot of cities do the same thing is, you know, if you go up to two inches or larger that you're digging under the roots and installing the utilities under the roots, not cutting through them. Um, don't let, you know, construction people just go and cut through stuff. You'll pay for it later. Sometimes it's decades later. I've had trees dump over and find out it was the water line that was installed 40 years ago at the park, but you get the wind at the right angle or because the neighbor logged and now those trees are being exposed to wind and they'll peel up and you're like, oh, that's weird. The roots are in a flat line. Well, anchor roots don't reestablish and um, you get your feeder roots and you get smaller anchor roots, but you, you, once you lose those big anchor roots, they're lost. So definitely take care to go around and take the time to go underneath the roots whenever possible. A lot of large utilities do that. Um, utilities and uh, like city of Seattle, Portland, Vancouver, they spend that money to do trenching underneath or to do trenching where they can go completely underneath the roots 100 feet before they pop up the other side. Um, and do air spading and things like that. So it's it's worth it. Pay the extra money, save the trees if you can. Um, also something we have to watch out for in the zoo world is you know climbing, leaping points, soil compaction is a big one because animals are always in the exhibit. The people are in there cleaning up after the animals every day. So we get high compaction. So we're always fluffing up the soil, planting grass seed in the spring and in the fall. Um, we're also laying logs and debris down in the animal exhibits so that we can plant along them so the animals can't step on the material. So sometimes we just lay branches down after we plant the ferns so the animals can't step directly on the ferns and crush them. Um, it's kind of like us putting plant stakes all over our yard when we first plant it in our yards, right? Um, like the bobcat, doesn't take a very big branch to climb up. So you can see this bobcat came up onto the maple tree. Um, pretty high. The flashing's off. It looks like the flashing's close, but it's actually, uh, it's outside the 10 foot jumping distance that um, are lined up for this animal. So we allow the animal to go up to that certain point, but I had to, uh, we had an emergency cut back a branch and like that's an ugly cut, right? Like uh, we'll come back and clean it up. Um, but it allows the cat to go up, but they can't get past the flashing on the trees. 
we don't want them going up 180 foot dug fir, um, especially if they're connected to the canopies outside the exhibits, right? Um, same thing like wolverines. We had to uh, hot wire off a lot of the trees, but we allowed them to have 17 trees in the exhibit. They can climb fully. They'll go up 40, 50 feet, go to the first branches and then eat like a piece of meat that's given to them to keep it away from the other wolverines. And then they'll slide back down the tree. It's pretty cool to allow that to happen, but we had to hire arborist and we had to shoot lines and break all the branches off or cut them, anything that was connecting outside the exhibit so that they couldn't climb up the tree and get out. At that point, Jake, I mean, do you have to do any modeling of this vegetation? I mean, is, is there just all eyeball, you know, calculations here in terms of, you know, you're thinking about the particular animal and the jump point and where the vegetation is sitting at. I mean, is, are yeah. there, I can imagine there's almost 3D modeling is necessary, right? To, yeah. to look what we do right now, it's pretty low and technical is, uh, you know, we come in with binoculars, um, we figure out, we use, we do use drones. Uh, we have a drone that we use on site so we can figure out on the height of the tree and like distance and, and it has a measuring tool on it. We'll use that. Um, but basically when I first came in, I wanted to know all the jumping distances of all the animals, right? And then all their abilities leap from the ground up or jump down or vice versa, like whatever they could possibly do. And then it was based on the animals we had in the current collection. And then anytime a new animal comes in before they go in an exhibit, we have a consulting meeting where we walk with the keepers and the curators. And it's like, hey, this is a new teenage bobcat. He likes water. He loves to swim now. All the other bobcats didn't. So now we have to change the exhibit to meet the individual's needs. Or like when the grizzly bears came in, when they came in as baby cubs, they were orphaned cubs, their one one ability, uh, you know, it may be different than when they're a thousand pounds, right? And so we alter and change the exhibit as the animals mature in age. And then eventually when they're geriatric, then we can add, allow things to grow in a little bit more because you know, they, they're not climbing and making that leap. Um, but we always have to guard and we rely on the keepers for observations and the interns and others, um, they observe the animals and they figure out how far they can jump. And we may all of a sudden find out, hey, guess what? This animal made this incredible jump at the zoo back in Oakland or, you know, Cleveland. Um, and nobody ever saw, you know, the tiger jump 20 feet before. And then all the zoos fall in line and everybody has Sumatran tigers, it changes their exhibits. So, we, you know, it's always changing constantly. Um, and we have to watch it. I can't, I have to watch all the time um, these exhibits, because some of these plants grow really quick, is it can change. And you can see how small this branch is that the uh, bobcat's on. Um, he goes way out on them. So um, he'll use that as a link point and jump off of that snag piece. And now that he has, he can stand with his, not his paws together, he can actually leap from that. So that's why the tree is actually topped, because it used to be a big alder hanging over our moat system. Hey, I want to make sure we have time for other questions in the group here that um, because this is this is fascinating stuff, Jake, that's for sure. But are, are there some questions here that we want to make sure that we're getting to Jake here? I just want to say, I think it's amazing that you're so invested in providing a space for the animals that they enjoy as well as people. I just I applaud you for that. It's so much more fun to go to that, watch something like that. That rather than to go to a zoo where you see all concrete, see yeah. the animals suffering in there, you know. That's kind of the key job of a zoo horticulturist is, you know, creating that natural space, whatever's allowed at the, each facility. But all the zoo horticulturists, this is kind of what we aim for. I, I didn't realize when I came to Northwest Trek that how special the place was because we had an existing forest. Um, we have it much more natural looking. But um, yeah, every zoo horticulturist, when you go to a zoo, when they're trying constantly they all these different combinations and learning the animals and figuring out how to make it work to create as much natural as possible but sometimes they don't have the ability to do everything they want right we have to marry up what the animal can do um also what the keepers want um and you know yeah it's uh, interesting and in the chat we're already talking about visiting and making the field trip out there jake so yeah. when's a good time to visit morning afternoon or Mornings. seasonal yeah. Mornings are always the best um, is because it's first in the morning, the animals are, they just put food out, they shift them off exhibit early in the morning and then put food out for them. And so they're going out as in the mornings to look. Same thing with our tours. Mornings, um, there's feed put down and then they put feed out in the afternoon also like in the free roaming area. Um, I mean, they get food laid out twice a day, at least, um, if not more. So the mornings are the best and then the afternoons the next right after lunch and they go through and then in the next couple hours they add more food and items. So um, I definitely encourage people to come out any time of the year is great because the seasonality of the animals, just like plants is constantly changing. Um, but, you know, spring's coming up. And so they'll be announcing when there's lots of baby animals. It's always fun to see all the hoof stock with baby animals and whatnot. 
Um, fall's great for rut season to see them exhibiting rut season while you're driving right by them. Other questions, comments for Jake here. And like your next slide, Jake, you're, you're willing to recruit for help here, huh? Yeah. So I know you guys are a little bit farther out, but I always encourage people to obviously come and visit the park whenever you're out this way. They can do it as a trip in, in, its, in itself. Um, you can come out here and spend the whole day out here if you want. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but you can also a comment. Like oh, what's what's that? A comment. Uh, I had my son's 10th birthday out there. And so we had a birthday party with a cake and hot dogs and the children enjoyed it and it was educational. And the other thing I might comment, it could be part of the pre-conference tour. Um, might be a suggestion. Yeah, it's definitely our rent. We have rental available and, um, and we have facilities that are non, you don't have to rent just, you know, tables and things to use, but you can also rent spaces also. Right. Um, we do weddings out here also, right. um, do conferences. Um, we have, I'm actually in the conference space right now. That's one of the buildings out on a peninsula sticking out in the lake. Um, that's its own uh, facility separate. Um, so you can rent that. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, to spend a whole day or you know, businesses using it. Um, you also are close to Mount Rainier. We're, you know, 30, 45 minutes away from Mount Rainier. So sometimes people come here, spend a couple hours and then continue on to Mount Rainier. Um, so it's kind of an all-in-one, you know, package you can do. Um, we also have uh, volunteer uh, ability. So we have individuals that volunteer on a regular basis. Um, they'll come out weekly sometimes, but we also have groups and businesses. So I'll have like Comcast out here and REI, um, Washington Readers Association. I've had attorney generals out here. Like you'll have all these different various groups and we'll match their interests. But a lot of times they're interested in doing conservation projects or working with the animals and building, you know, hammocks out of fire hoses. But they'll sometimes we're just planting or edging lawns and like, um, or do helping us with our new, you know, planting our new tour station that's being built. Um, so the whole groups can come out and also and volunteer um, for three hours to all day if they want. So. How has this experience, Jake, transformed into your own personal garden and your personal landscape? Ah, good question. Um, so I definitely, um, you know, like I said, I was interested in, in exotic plants from introduced from around the world. And so like my own garden now has a lot of native plants in it. Um, I do pay attention a lot to in my, in my own space um, that I don't put plants that obviously can get out into the wild. Um, you know, I grew up with this naturalistic garden um, and, you know, interest, and I always loved those places that had plants that were naturalizing through the woods. And I definitely pulled back from doing that um, as much as uh, um, there's certain plants that would be fine out in the woods or along your trails, but you don't want, want plants that are like freely naturalized because they eventually go off well past where you're enjoying them and change and alter the landscape. So I definitely... I use a lot more natives now. Um, the line is I've learned is 25 to 30% native in your um, yard is the kind of the break line. If you have 25 to 30%, um, that's, that's a huge impact then for the wildlife. And then anything more than that is you know a benefit. If you have less than that, then it's really hard for the native animals to use that space because there's so much non-native stuff mixed in. Other questions, but, comments yeah. for Jake here. This is truly fascinating stuff, Jake, and, I, and it's amazing how you know it. Uh, you know, over your, you know, how the years of experience has really helped because you've had to learn not only the landscape but also the animals, or, or yeah. as, as the clients, as you refer to them here. I, you know, uh, you know, the gardening world is right. Like you can you can knock on a gardener's door and ask them, like, hey, can I, you know, these are really cool plants, like, and they're pretty welcoming. Gardeners share plants. Same thing in zoo horticulture. Um, I can knock on any zoo door or let them know that I'm, you know, going to be flying into New York or somewhere, and the zoo horticulturist there will more than happy show us around, um, and and show their special areas and their plants. Um, we have conferences just like other, uh, you know, interest groups do, uh, where we have zoo horticulture conferences where we travel around to different zoos every year and share our knowledge with each other, um, just like master gardeners do. So it's, it's no different in the zoo world is uh, we are definitely a big sharing group and we like to show off like what we know and <laughs> bring in young people um, into the fold, right? And um, give them interested also. Well, there clearly is a lot to show off and you show, you're show you showing off a lot. This is this is definitely going to be on a bucket list here for some trips here. I think we're going to we're going to have to get some get some tours here going. 
Other questions for Jake? We can let him get back to dealing with it, uh, you know, with, with whatever, whatever daily trauma, you know, is it, uh, is presents itself. Because I imagine there are a lot of 911 call Jake you know, calls. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's always something going on. I have no question. I just want to thank you for just fabulous, interesting, and, you know, inspiring, really, um, presentation i'm thinking how do i attract bears to my yard uh, but i think my neighbors won't like me then uh, you know after that anymore anyway it was really interesting i absolutely enjoyed it thank you oh, thank you for definitely anytime you can share what the wildlife with your yard it's uh, definitely a, a great ad addition right if you can do it in a nice way right that doesn't hurt too many things <laughs> Jake, thank you so very much for joining us here this morning. And indeed, that um, uh, you know you can be reached then at um, at the Northwest Trek uh, website, and at um, and at uh, and I, again, this is an invaluable, invaluable feedback here for us all. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks to Jake for a phenomenal presentation here, and it, uh, this will indeed conclude our official meeting here. I'm going to go ahead and, it, um, and it, uh, stop the recording.